James Van Allen was responsible for the Geiger Muller tubes on board the first American satellites. These tubes detected zones of charged particles surrounding the Earth, which were later called the Van Allen radiation belts. And what are these belts, and can human activity have any effect on these belts at all? Well, the first thing to say is that normally actually two Van Allen radiation belts, an inner one and an outer one. These types of radiation belts also have been found around other planets as well as just the Earth. Sometimes these belts can merge together or even separate into three different belts. However, these belts aren't shaped like kind of planetary rings. Instead, they form kind of a form of torus and maintained by the shape by the Earth's magnetosphere or the magnetic shell around our planet. The belts bulge out around the equatorial regions, then curve in towards the surface of the Earth as they approach the magnetic poles. They normally start an altitude around 400 miles from the Earth's surface and stretch out to 36,000 miles, an altitude range which covers many of the satellites in orbit around our Earth. And they can represent a threat to their continued operation, but less of a threat to spacecraft exploring the depths of our solar system, they spend a relatively short length of time within the belts themselves. And whilst the magnetosphere around the Earth shapes the radiation belts, it isn't the actual source for radiation. Instead, the source is the sun. The high energy electrons which form the majority of the radiation in both belts are not only powered from the solar wind coming from the sun, they also can be pushed by these same winds. In fact, the position of the belts is actually in a fairly constant state of flux as a number of competing forces all try to push and manipulate the size and shape of the belts. The first force I mentioned is that of the sun, which is constantly pushing radiation towards or even past the Earth. And whilst these solar winds are always there, they can dramatically change in intensity with solar activity. But even then, the belts are actually quite high up, they still can be disturbed by movements within the Earth's ionosphere. It can create an interference-like pattern or zebra stripe to appear longitudinally within the inner radiation belt. Then the Earth's magnetic field pushes the radiation outwards. This plasmosphere consists of relatively well-ordered cold plasma, absorbing most of the high energy electrons before they get near to the Earth. However, due to the link with the Earth's magnetic field, the further you go out from the Earth, the plasma sphere weakens. Eventually, over time, relatively weak push of the plasma sphere, the edge, and has to push some of the radiation kind of round the edges of the Earth. But that is then restocked with more radiation coming in from the Sun. So whilst it offers a great deal of protection at the surface of the Earth, it also ends up kind of trapping radiation within the belts. Now, under normal circumstances, the solar wind actually isn't strong enough to penetrate far into the plasma sphere, so it reaches a kind of limit to its power, forming the outer radiation belt. However, occasionally a powerful burst of energy comes from the sun which penetrates deep into the plasma sphere before eventually it's slowed down by the increasing force of that same plasma sphere closer to the Earth. This solar energy basically then restocks the inner radiation belt, which is why we normally have fairly two distinct radiation belts, the gap between the two of them. However, as the magnetic field curves from pole to pole, so does the region occupied by the belt. But within the Earth's magnetic field, there's actually something called the South Atlantic Anomaly. I should tell you actually where to find it. This area is actually fairly close to the southern magnetic pole of the Earth. The Earth's magnetic field isn't uniform due to how the Earth's core actually moves. So it's stronger over things like Singapore and weaker on the opposite side of the Earth in the South Atlantic. This weaker area means that this is the location where the Van Allen radiation belt is actually closest to the surface of the Earth. It means that satellites going through this region can need extra protection. Now, natural processes are not the only ones that can alter the size and the shape of the radiation belts around the Earth. Humans can also directly change what is happening far above the surface of the Earth by the use of what's known as very low frequency radio transmissions. These transmissions 
not really that useful for normal communication because it can contain a limited amount of information. However, they're great at penetrating through things like water and mountains. Things like that penetrate fairly deeply into seawater can actually be used for communicating with submarines whilst they're still actually submerged. Result? Most VLF radio transmissions are used for military reasons. Also appears to be a side effect of these communications, as well as being able to penetrate the oceans, these broadcasts can travel up to an altitude of around 40 miles fairly easily. These VLF transmissions then seem to have helped push the inner part of the Van Allen radiation belt outward. It may have actually reduced the amount of radiation around the Earth, and certainly around low orbiting satellites. It's not yet known if there could be a negative effect of this extra shielding for the Earth, but it is unlikely. It's also possible though we could actually use these VLF transmissions to protect the Earth from the dangers of a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection by giving us an extra layer of protection. Now, for this to actually really be practical, we would need a greater number of powerful transmitters than are currently in operation around the Earth. So that's the Van Allen radiation belts. It was useful.